the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of so therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. The Gospel of our Savior. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts <clears throat> be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our freedom. Amen. Please be seated. Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. Come, go down to the potter's house. As many of you know, my wife Ashley has enjoyed making dishes and jewelry out of ceramic clay. Some of you actually own and are wearing right now some of her jewelry, especially her Celtic cross medallions and her, her prayer labyrinths, which is an important image for us. We were married on the prayer labyrinth at Grace Cathedral. And she's loved connecting with uh, ceramic artists here, like Laura Rose and Julie Cairns. And she gets really excited and rejuvenated by the process of creating, even though it can sometimes be quite challenging and frustrating. I've learned from her that sometimes in ceramics, the potter wants to make the clay into one thing while the clay seems to have a mind of its own and wants to be made into something else. And the clay will remain stubborn until the potter and the clay get on the same wavelength. And it's for this reason that Many of the bowls she has made are not really shaped as perfect circles. And I can't help but think of this when I hear of the prophet Jeremiah's visit to the potter's house in our reading this morning. After he hears the voice of the Lord say, Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will speak to you. There I will let you hear my words. And so he goes, and there he notices this potter forming a vessel out of the clay. And the clay seems to be deforming and folding in on itself, thus requiring the potter to start over, to try pulling and forming another vessel out of the same clay. So while Jeremiah is watching and absorbing this creative act, which can be fairly hypnotic for those who are watching it, he receives this prophetic insight about the way... God works with God's people. Jeremiah hears God say to him and then through him. In the original Hebrew, Hine ka chomer beyad ha yozer, ken atem beyadi. Sounds poetic, doesn't it? Hine ka chomer beyad ha yozer, ken atem beyadi. Look, 
Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. Jeremiah then expands and elaborates on this beautiful image in many ways, primarily in an attempt to rouse the people of Israel to repent and to thus avoid the impending disaster and destruction of Babylonian invasion. However, I feel Jeremiah's wonderful image of human and divine creativity inviting us to reflect on the creative process in general, a process in which we all participate as people who create and as people who are continually being created and recreated by God. And it's appropriate to think about it this way, especially here in Humboldt County, which boasts more artists per capita than any other county in California. Many of you, I know, are successful artists. You know the creative process very well. But even so, we, we still often have this romantic view of the artist or writer or musician who sits at the desk or studio each day simply allowing the creative muse to flow smoothly through him or her to the paper or canvas. And what I appreciate so much about this reading from Scripture about Jeremiah's image, is the fact that the artist, the potter, seems to be struggling. The potter has an idea of what he wants to make and starts to slowly and carefully form it, but then it's falling apart. So all that time he put into the project seems to have been a waste because he has to start all over again, afresh. I really appreciate this because that's often how I have experienced the creative process, right? I'm sure many of you have as well. Most recent example is a few years ago in my doctoral program, I spent years trying to complete this dissertation just as the potter tried to form the clay. And my work kept deforming and folding in on itself. I remember working for a whole year, and after more than a year, I felt I had really nothing to show for all my research and hard work and writing. I felt like a potter working tirelessly at the wheel and not producing a thing. And there came a time when I had to consider the possibility that maybe these just weren't my gifts. Maybe I need to just cut my losses and move on to something else. Maybe I did not accurately estimate the cost, like the person in Christ's parable. And maybe I did not consider whether I really had enough mental, emotional, and spiritual resources to see my project through to the end, like someone who lays the foundation for a tower and cannot complete it. Or like the king who did not have sufficient troops to go to battle and has to raise the flag of surrender. But ultimately, I really could not give up working on my impossibly stubborn dissertation. I had to sacrifice jobs and teaching opportunities and time with family and friends and time at church in order to keep grinding away at what felt like a lost cause. And it took years to get on the same wavelength as the clay of my dissertation. But after several years, I finally got it done and I realized that throughout that process, God, the divine potter, was continuing to mold and form me. Even at those times when I felt like nothing was getting done. And I thought about that recently, uh, more than a year ago, when uh, my mentor, and actually the person who served on my dissertation committee, Arthur Holder, preached right here at my installation and said that Daniel did not need a Ph.D. to be the rector of Christ Church, but Daniel needed a Ph.D. to become Daniel. That made sense to me. The process formed me into who I am now. 
I've learned that part of the creative process involves trusting that God and God's creativity is at work within us, even when things look and feel unproductive and hopeless. The process involves giving God the freedom and the time. This great theologian talks about the slow work of God, giving God time to mold us and stretch us and refine us like clay. And it is a process that we ought not enter into lightly or naively. I feel the psalmist in this morning's beautiful song, maybe one of my favorite psalms ever, seems to embody the role of the clay. When he says, You press upon me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. He feels he's being molded by God. And as we're being molded, we feel maybe some resistance or some pressure or some pain. Because giving ourselves over to the divine creative process requires an openness to change, which might be painful, and an openness to maybe immense sacrifice. Immense sacrifice. And Jesus knows this very well. Which is why he warns us this morning in a profoundly challenging and I would say even disturbing way to enter not lightly into this process of being shaped by God. Last Sunday, Father Shoemaker pointed out how difficult some of these sayings of Jesus can be. Pastor Karen Stanley preached on a hard saying a few weeks ago. So did Father Shoemaker, so did Pam. I gotta say, I feel like this one takes the cake, right? Whoever does not hate father, mother, wife, and children, yes, even his own life, cannot be my disciple. It's not the best gospel reading for a family-friendly Sunday with you know, bounce house for children. Hoping we could have something else. Remember three years ago, it came up during Labor Day, which was a more appropriate time when people are on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Got to deal with it today. And that really is the word. If you look in the original Greek, it's hate. It's important to realize, though, that at the time, that word was used differently. It's not quite the way we use it now, whereas, or when we use it now, it's, it's often kind of this disgust or repulsion or loathsome, loathsome feeling towards someone. It's not quite that in the first century of Palestine. It's, it's more uh, explaining priority. In the Hebrew Bible, God says, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. He did not actually hate Esau. It's just that there seemed to be a preference. And there was a priority. Jacob was prioritized. And this is Jesus' very intense and hyperbolic and challenging way of getting us to prioritize. And to realize the sacrifice required in being his disciple. The gospel, and this gospel message in particular, is not for the faint-hearted. This is Jesus' hard and even almost abrasive and harsh way of saying, if you want to be formed by God's hands and made into his beautiful masterpiece, and submit yourselves to, to the divine creative process, you need to be willing to make some serious sacrifices. And those sacrifices may involve some of our most personal and profound relationships. They may involve our biggest hopes and greatest dreams. The process may require us to let go and even give up on a profession, a project, or a career path. In order to be that malleable clay in God's hands, we need to be willing to let go and sometimes make some painful sacrifices. 
And sometimes we'll do that kicking and screaming, just like some of the saints of Scripture. Another great Hebrew prophet, Isaiah, also used this image, compared the relationship between the potter and the clay with that of God and humanity when he said, Woe to those who quarrel with their maker, those who are nothing but pot shards among pot, shard, pot shards on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Does your work say the potter has no hands? Who are we to question our maker? And yet, as I pointed out, the more I have studied scripture, the more I read, I do see the clay questioning the potter. From Abraham to Job to the psalmist and even to Jesus of Nazareth himself, I see the saints of Scripture question and even quarrel with God. In many cases, it seems that the potter and the clay really need to be working together. There are indeed times when we are called to be submissive and even docile in God's loving hands, but ultimately, we are called to be collaborators and co-creators with God. Remember, as I preached a while ago, Islam means submission to God. That's not our tradition. Our tradition is Israel, which means what? We wrestle with God. We struggle with God. We co-collaborate and we co-create with God. Sometimes there's a little push and shove. As the late psychiatrist and theologian Gerald May said, we are not the authors of our life with God, but nor are we just pawns. We are participant co-creators. God will be active within us irrevocably, but we bring immeasurable beauty to that process when we affirm it and when we choose it and actively join in it. The creative process as both a creature and a creator can be brutal and demanding and can require enormous sacrifice. But the God who created our inmost parts, who knitted us together within our mother's womb, promises to never give up on us, no matter how stubborn we might be. God wants to co-create with us as God's beloved creatures and as people blessed with the gift of creativity within ourselves. Some people actually believe that when the Bible says we're made in the image of God, the imago dei, that is referring to our creativity, to our impulse to create. Our creativity is the divine within us. God invites us to join, to join him in singing the song, in writing the story, in painting the canvas, in molding the clay that is our life individually and here as a community at Christ Church. Although the project might feel like it's going sometimes nowhere fast, it is by working with the clay as the potter and by working with the potter as the clay that we can become a vital part of God's marvelous works, fearfully and wonderfully made. And we can rejoice with the psalmist and say, we thank you, God, because we are marvelously made and because we have the privilege to marvelously make. Your works are wonderful, O oh God, I know this full well. And although we may give up or even feel called by God to give up sometimes on various creative projects, as I said, God never gives up on the clay that is our lives. The potter does not just throw clay in the trash because it's not cooperating. The potter will temporarily take the clay off the wheel to re-wedge it and then throw it back for another pull, but never just throws it away. As the potter, God never gives up on us, even when we might be stubborn clay. And today, as we begin our church's 150th year, we are invited to continue to be molded by the divine potter. And we are offering a plethora of amazing opportunities to let God shape us and transform us. As you can read in our brochure and in the chronicle, at the back of the chronicle is the brochure as well for all of our programs this upcoming year. And also several long-term creative projects have already been brought to their dramatic completion just this last week. The installation of our new steeple cross and the repainting of our prayer labyrinth, two major pots that have been on the wheel for more than a year. I've been wanting to get that labyrinth repainted since before I even arrived. 
And these successes should not be overshadowed by the setback that we also experienced this week, as I'm sure you all know, the vandalism of our red entry doors on H Street. And we'll throw the clay of that project on the wheel for some re-wedging. But this setback really just adds another layer to our celebration today because we will bounce back from this as we begin our 150th year, which will be marked by a series of events that showcase the many successes that make up this community and this space. And we will continue to follow Jesus Christ as his disciples, knowing that that requires immense sacrifice, or at least a willingness to make sacrifices, and to trust the process, even when it might feel slow or even hopeless, and to practice patience as God continues the creative and holy and life-giving work he began in us 150 years ago. Amen.